might ask. And Votiwa, because of his analysis of shame, takes that question very seriously. Um, uh, the answer to that question is, you still have to wait. But, <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> but the way, um, the re what I mean by what he was saying, um, taking it seriously, it's because this absorption of shame by love means that when the two people love each other, meaning, in, in, among other things, they start to believe and know that the other person loves them and therefore will cherish them, then the desire for intimacy grows, and the need and even the feeling of shame diminishes. And that is how it is supposed to be. And so um, that just makes it harder to wait until marriage. It doesn't mean that what's happening is wrong. It's supposed to happen that way. And then there are reasons, and I, even a personalist argument, I don't have time to do it in this talk, but maybe at some point we could talk about it. Very interesting personal argument, personalist argument based on this to express why the vet, wedding vows are necessary before this full bodily um, expression of intimacy revealing is, is possible, is, is, can, be, can be morally acceptable. But okay, so that's his analysis of shame. Now let's keep going here. Um, so. Um, now I would like to deepen what I've been telling you in another way. Wojtyla's discussion of three views, sensualism, puritanism, and, Catholic, and a Catholic, Catholic view. Um, Wojtyla holds the view, which at first seems contradictory, that the sensualists and the puritans are in theory identical. The theoretical identity of these two views is that they are both grounded in utilitarian principles. And that fact led them both to becoming utilitarian in practice. For Wojtyla, that means that they are forms of reducing persons to objects of use, a means which is always opposed to love. The reason for which sensualism represents a form of utilitarianism is because the other person is sought as a means for the gratification of one's own urge for pleasure. Wojtyla, unlike the Puritans, thinks that the pleasure of sex is good. And I will give his account of that later. <clears throat> what he objects to is the elevation and isolation of pleasure to the level of an end to be achieved and the degradation of another person in the sense of thinking of that person as having value only because they can cause you pleasure. That's like a variation on the slavery thing I said before. The Puritans, Wojtyla points out, reacted against the headlong pursuit of pleasure with a theory that mimicked Christianity, but it wasn't Christian. It was utilitarian. The following quote, in the following quote, Wojtyla offers a concise formulation of the wrong, the utilitarian view of those Puritans that they thought, and they thought this way about God too. They thought of God as a utilitarian. Here's what Wojtyla says about the Puritans. So I'm reading to you, he's talking about the wrong view. He thinks this is wrong. This view, this puritanical wrong view, in its developed form holds that in using man and woman in their sexual intercourse to assure the existence of the species homo, the creator himself uses persons as a means to his end. It follows from this wrong view that conjugal life and sexual intercourse are good only because they serve the purpose of procreation. A man, therefore, does well in this wrong view when he uses a woman as the indispensable means of obtaining posterity. The use of a person for the objective end of procreation is the very essence, in this wrong view, of marriage. Voitiva, then, develops two different types of use, both of which are utilitarian. The first is when someone thinks of their spouse as a means in sexual relations for producing the end of a baby, and the other is when one thinks of one's spouse as a means for gratifying one's own urges for pleasure. There, of course, we had in that last one, when he was giving theology of the body, he said you, a man could commit adultery in the heart with his wife. Surprised everybody, and that's what he means. While Wojtyla rejects both of these as violations of the personalistic norm, the Puritans rejected only the second. Utilizing this distinction between the two types of using persons as a means, Wojtyla continues his formulation of the erroneous utilitarian view held by the Puritans. To use in this way for procreation is a good thing. Using in the second sense, on the other hand, seeking pleasure and enjoyment in intercourse is wrong. 
Although it is indisso indissociable from use in the first sense, it has an intrinsically impure element, a sort of necessary evil. That evil, the pleasure of sexual relations, however, must be tolerated since there's no way of eliminating it. <laughs> Boitiva then goes on to say that there is an experience of deep joy which can be experienced by spouses when they love each other as persons. He holds the view that by focusing on the person of the spouse and loving her, rather than focusing on oneself in the headlong pursuit of pleasure, this joy comes into being. He also holds the view that one of the real sources of this joy is precisely the pleasure of sexual relations in that integrated setting. And here's a quote where he says that. This joy, this fui, may be bestowed either by the great variety of pleasures connected with the differences of sex or by the sexual enjoyment which conjugal relations can bring. The Creator designed this joy and linked it with love between man and woman insofar as that love develops on the basis of the sexual urge in a normal manner, in other words, in a manner worthy of human persons. But Votiva also holds um, and this is surprising, but let's see how he develops it. Boitiva also holds that focusing exclusively, and in some places he even says primarily, on the result of sex, namely a child, one can, it is possible to, he says, avoid loving one's spouse. Boitiva's way out of the two forms of utilitarianism is not, obviously, to reject either procreation and so, and or, or, or the pleasure of sexuality, but to realize that the love between the spouses is the foundation of sexual relations and all the fruits that flow from them. And now we have a striking quote from Love and Responsibility. Marital intercourse is and should be the result of reciprocal betrothed love between spouses, of the gift of self made by one person to another, Intercourse is necessary to love, not just to procreation. Marriage is an institution which exists for the sake of love, not merely for the purpose of biological reproduction. And then here's the, here's the line that's, I think, the heart of his particular emphasis on the unitive meeting, which is attracting many people. Marital intercourse is in itself an interpersonal act, an act of betrothed love, so that the intentions and the attention of each partner must be fixed upon the other. And then he says there, they must not be concentrated on the possible consequences, especially if that would mean a diversion of attention from the partner. This view, clear in the Catholic worldview, is simply the idea that in sexual relations a profound love can be shown to one's spouse. Um, and that one's spouse ought to be the focus, otherwise how could one love her? The quote continues, It is certainly not necessary always to resolve that we are performing this act in order to become parents. It is sufficient to say that in performing this act we know that we may become parents and we are willing for that to happen. Um, that approach alone is compatible with love and makes it possible to share the experience of love. A man and woman become father and mother only in the consequence of a marital act, which is an act of love, a unification of persons, and not merely an instrument or means of procreation. Those are some strong texts in Voitiwa, but they in no way go in a, I have a whole other talk, but I can't talk about it now, of showing that these texts in no way go in the direction of, of, of birth control. Um, um, but I, I'm not going to go down that path. They're just talking about his unique expression of the meaning of the unitive dimension of married love, and that is what is very much attracting many people. Um, and he, he also has places where he says that children are the embodiment of the love, this love, or the child is the embodiment of that. So he also has very, he's just emphasizing a different point right here. This past semester, I was teaching these texts of Hoiti when one of my students, Kevin Mohan, I'm naming my student because it was such a profound point, raised his hand and said to me, do you think that the Puritans would be in favor of IVF? I was taken aback because it is a profound insight. We talked it through during class and then I thought about it. And I wonder, you can tell me what you think of this. I wonder if we couldn't say that the following two assertions are true. 
about our contemporary culture. The first one, the love only view, which really boils down to the self gratification only view, leads not only to the exclusion of the procreative dimension, but directly to the contraceptive mentality and the widespread practice of abortion. That's a common thought we've all probably thought before. But here's the second assertion, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this. The puritanical mentality of procreation only, or increasing the number of members in our species, as they say, leads not only to the exclusion of the pleasure of sex, and with that, of any focus whatsoever on the person of one's spouse and love, but also directly to the IVF and cloning mentality. In other words, I want, the thing I'm wondering after he asked me that question is, these two views, the sensualist and the Puritan, which are deeply embedded in the historical culture of our society, I wonder if they have fermented into these two immoral practices, radical promiscuity on the one hand, and then all this uh, creating people just, Anyways, you can tell me if you think that makes sense, but I think there might be a uh, connection there. Okay, so now we're at part two, which is um, some thoughts on Dr. Waldstein's um, introduction in particular. And one of the things I should say is that um, we wrote our papers relatively recently, and mine is, um, bef I wrote much of this before I received my copy of his, and, and also I gave mine actually to him even later than he gave his to mine. And so that means there's a little not exact lining up here. I'm going to focus in these remarks on his introduction to Theology of the Body, and when it appears like I can do it, I'll try to think also of some things he said today, because they are very related. The core point is today and in the introduction, the core point I want to make. So that's the same. And then I might have some other specific things from, from what he said today also. Okay. Dr. Michael Waldstein has given us a gift in this excellent and exact new translation of John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Additionally, in his extensive introduction, he has made original contributions to Wojtyla studies. The most beautiful of which, in my opinion, is his having had the insight to see that the thought of St. John of the Cross, even if not explicitly cited by John Paul in either of those two works, must come through all of his work. Carol Wojtyla was a young man, made tender, even raw, by the loss of his entire family and the takeover of his hometown by evil, ruthless men. In the midst of such personal anguish, divine providence literally put into his hands the writings of John of the Cross. With that Jan, Jan Taranowski, that's his name, right? And uh, to absorb an author as rich as John of the Cross at the most, most raw and tender moment of one's life cannot but mean that those writings will reach to the deepest core of the soul and remain with the person coloring the rest of his life and thought. To understand that, and then to search through the writings of John looking for that influence on theology of the body was not only a great insight of Waldstein's, but also he succeeded at it. There are such connections, and they are beautiful and true. I do, however, have one critique of Dr. Waldstein's introduction, and I would like to respectfully submit for consideration the following. The points I made in part one of my talk concerning the human dimension of theology of the body are not to be found in the writings of St. John of the Cross or Thomas Aquinas. With that, I do not mean to assert that a mystic like St. John of the Cross did not have a palpable living inner experience of the deepest form of self-donation between him and God. Of course he did. What I mean is that the philosophical content, namely the explication of shame intimacy, human expression, and the subtlety with which those dimensions of human life have been explored by Shaler, Stein, and von Hildebrand are not to be found in the philosophical and theological writings of John of the Cross and Thomas Aquinas. They did not explicate the dimensions of human experience that I have just attempted to express to you in the first part of my talk. Now, I'm going to say something, another thing, and I say it in all charity, and that's one of the, two years, I said two years we talked to each other, but actually eight years, but the last two years have been more vigorous, because he's been writing this, and giving me the earlier versions of the introduction, and then this book he's writing also, giving me the chapters, so the last two years, which the book isn't out yet, his book he's writing, 
very vigorous discussions. And, and one of the things we both like about it is we sit there in his office and we're very blunt with each other, but we also have this friendship underlying it all, which is very nice. So, okay. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to say one of one of those things that I might I might say to him in his office um, here, in public, so he feels a little bit of shame, not too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, and also not only because of that, but because this is I think dialogue. The John Paul II. This is exactly when he keeps talking about dialogue. What's he what how how he wants us to do it. So, um, okay. So here's the point, it's underlined there. Dr. Wallerstein's introduction gives the distinct impression that there is no Schillerian influence precisely on the personalism of John Paul II by Max Scheler, but that any such influence comes exclusively from John of the Cross. Now that impression comes across, across quite strongly for two reasons in the introduction. One of them is his analysis of Scheler in the text, which seems to me in need of refinement. And I'll make a general point about that later. But another reason, and this is what I'm focusing on, that this impression comes across through the text of his introduction is that there is hardly any mention of the points I've tried to express today, or of the Schillerian sources from which they sprang, and also the Edith Stein sources, as was already mentioned in that book on empathy. Carol Wojtyla dedicated an entire chapter to love and response. Now, the, I know I'm going to try to prove this point, this second point. Um, Carol Wojtyla dedicated an entire chapter in Love and Responsibility to Shame. It's called The Metaphysics of Shame. And in the first line of that chapter, he cites Shaler as his source. Back, this is a personal point here. Back in 1990, when I was thinking about which topic to write on for my MA thesis in philosophy, I was talking with John Crosby, who had hoped to come to our conference, but he can't, about my, my ideas for my MA thesis. And he told me that in a conversation he had had with John Paul II, the Pope expressed and formed he was by Shaler's insightful and good essay and how much he learned from it. And if you read Metaphysics of Shame, you'll notice he corrects it in some places too. Um, and because of that, Crosby suggested that I consider writing my MA thesis on a comparison between Shaler's essay on shame and how it got incorporated into love and responsibility and theology of the body, which I then did that. John Paul II also cites Shaler in the sections of theology of the body where the topic of shame occurs. Yeah, also in TOB. There, that is a major positive influence. Major which I think lends itself to more explanation, particularly in terms of a personalist influence of Shaler on Wojtyla. Um, and, uh, the phrase of Wojtyla, look, a body that expresses a person, is taken directly from Shaler, um, as is the way of getting that idea across. It's another point. Another point. Also in Love and Responsibility, Wojtyla has a chapter titled The Rehabilitation of Chastity. In the opening paragraphs of that chapter, he says, that he named this chapter after Max Scheler's article titled The Rehabilitation of Virtue. He says that in the book. Then He then goes on to explain why he did it. The reason he gives is that Scheler's study of resentment accurately captures a systemic problem, resentment, of people in our day that did not throw, flow through the veins of the people in Thomas's day. Carol Wojtyla says that, and he gives Shaler the credit for the foundational idea of this chapter. He talks about asadia. Thomas's concept of asadia is not, he, he couldn't, almost, he says he couldn't really even have known about the widespread resentment we have now. And so Shaler makes a step beyond Thomas in, in that regard, and Wojtyla says it, and the name's a chapter after him because of it. Dr. Waldstein expresses the view that, as he refers to it, the depth structure of Wojtyla's personalism comes exclusively from John of the Cross. Uh, and today, oh, okay. But the work in which Wojtyla explores the depth structure of the subjectivity of persons with philosophical rigor is not his habilitation. It's the acting person. And I would like to read to you the way in which Wojtyla himself introduces the book, The Acting Person, in the section where he gives a kind of sweeping credit to his sources before he starts writing 
granted the author's acquaintance with a traditional Aristotelian thought, it is, however, the work of Max Scheler that has been a major influence upon his reflection. In my overall conception of the person envisaged through the mechanisms of his operative systems and their variations as presented here may indeed be seen the Schillerian foundation studied in my previous work. Consider the phrase overall conception of the person through the mechanisms of his operative systems and so on. I don't think it would be a misuse of the term depth structure of one's personalism to characterize the meaning of those words. There is no mention of John of the Cross at the beginning of um, the acting person. And while there is mention of Aristotle, and in the second preface, he groups Aquinas with Aristotle. He says this twice, two prefaces, and he adds Aquinas to the second one with Aristotle. That is only to say that Aristotle and Aquinas were not where he found the primary source for this book, The Acting Person, which, as I said, is the one in which he explores with rigor the inner workings of the subject. It is, as he says, the thought and teaching of Max Scheler who forms the foundation of his, of, 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 its overall conception, of his overall conception of the person here. But even more importantly than this is the way in which Scheler's notion of the individual uniqueness of each person impressed itself on the soul of Wojtyla. Consider this text of John Paul II from Gift and Mystery. That's the book that he wrote to thank God for being a priest for 50 years and to priests. After my priestly ordination, I was sent to Rome to complete my studies. These studies resulted in my doctorate on St. John of the Cross and then the dissertation on Max Scheler, which qualified me for university teaching. Specifically, I wrote on the contribution which Scheler's phenomenological type of ethical system can make to the development of moral theology. This research benefited me greatly. My previous Aristotelian Thomistic formation was enriched by the phenomenological method. And this made it possible for me to undertake a number of creative studies. I am thinking, above all, of my book, The Acting Person. In this way, I took part in the contemporary movement of philosophical personalism. And my studies were able to bear fruit in my pastoral work. I have often noticed how many of the ideas developed in these studies have helped me in my meetings with individuals and with great numbers of the faithful during my apostolic vision visits. My formation within the cultural horizon of personalism also gave me a deeper awareness of how each individual is a unique person. I think that this awareness is very important for every priest. And I wrote a whole Dr. Seifert mentioned it, article on this relation of Scherer's individual uniqueness, that he calls it individual value essence and so forth, of each person. You can't find, it is true that you cannot find in the writings of Wojtyla or the Pope, a developed philosophy of personal uniqueness. Max Scheler and John Crosby do that. But if you go through all the books and find, you can find so many pastoral, and um, theological texts, which, which just, just are full of a rich, hilarious idea of unique persons. And I wrote a paper about that, and I, I collected all those texts. And uh, it's very beautiful. And Shaler is the only person.